This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about the dangers of Bitcoin address reuse. Whenever you have Bitcoin sent to you, whenever you withdraw Bitcoin from an exchange and have it sent to a wallet that you control, whenever you as a merchant receive Bitcoin on-chain, we're not talking about the Lightning Network here, but a regular on-chain payment, when you as a merchant receive one from customers, or whenever a friend sends you Bitcoin, you should always, always, always use a fresh new Bitcoin address that has never been used before to receive that Bitcoin payment. And there are a number of reasons for that. If you reuse a Bitcoin address, number one, it makes it easier for everyone who's looking at the Bitcoin blockchain, including chain surveillance companies, intelligence agencies, and maybe even your neighbor, neighbors we're gonna see, it makes it easier for all these people to associate those transactions with you and build a more complete view of your financial activity. Here would be an example. Let's say you've been stacking sats for a few years and are currently holding your entire stack of one Bitcoin at this Bitcoin address, this BC1 address. Now you ask your neighbor to pay you 0.01 Bitcoin because you won your bet for that Mike Tyson, Jake Paul fight. You give your neighbor the same Bitcoin address where you've been storing everything, this BC1 address up here. In other words, you reuse a Bitcoin address and he sends you that 0.01 Bitcoin to that address and then looks it up on a public block explorer, which we're going to look at in a moment, looks it up out of curiosity. Now your neighbor knows that you also had 1.0. You had a whole Bitcoin sitting right there at that address. So even if you had gone to all the trouble and bought all of that Bitcoin from a non-KYC source where you didn't have to give up any personal information, you just destroyed that privacy and leaked it to your neighbor by letting him know that you control that address by reusing it as a receive address. Now Sparrow Wallet does a very good job of tracking this. This is a free desktop and laptop wallet that you can download from sparrowwallet.com. Make sure you're using the correct uh, URL. This is what it looks like when you do address re, uh, reuse inside of Sparrow. You get this, this little uh, exclamation point in the red. So I can see here that I reuse this address that begins with BC1 QC4 ZD. And what I'm where I am right here, this is the UTXO tab. So Bitcoin does not use the account system as we're going to see it uses UTXOs. These are unspent transaction outputs. If we look at the balance of this wallet, what the, what the wallet does is it aggregates all those UTXOs and tells me that I own 45,000 or I control 45,000 sats in this wallet, which is currently about $41. But that 45,000 sats is actually comprised of these three UTXOs and two of them are reusing the same Bitcoin address. We have 10,000 sats here, 15,000 sats and 20,000 sats. So that's what it looks like on Sparrow, we can now take these Bitcoin addresses and we can use a public block explorer. You probably should not use a public one as I'm about to do if you have significant amounts of money there because someone could correlate your IP address with that Bitcoin address. This is one reason it's better to run your own instance of mempool.space, but that's a whole nother discussion. Basically here, we're gonna be using mempool.space. We're gonna put in the search box up here, we just put this Bitcoin address and we can see what this looks like on chain. You can see I've received 10,000 sats yesterday right here and 15,000 sats right here to the same Bitcoin address. It's now holding two UTXOs and is holding a balance of 25,000 sats, about 22, 23 dollars. Now that other address down here that was not reused, this one ending in G, E J S that has 20,000 sats. We can look that up on the block explorer and see what it looks like. And we can see my 20,000 sats sitting there, one UTXO, and we can see that it's uh, been received right here. There was a, this is the input on the left side. The sender sent me some uh, sats and then sent someone else some sats. This is actually coming. Actually, I'm not going to tell you where it's coming from because I don't want to add any more to the chain surveillance companies. But this is what it looks like on chain. The nice thing about Sparrow allows you to generate probably billions of new Bitcoin addresses for each wallet. I can't remember the exact number, but it's it's in the millions or billions. And it lets you know right here, if you go in the receive tab, here's a Bitcoin address for this wallet. This has never been used. There's a green check mark here. When I do use it, I can put a label in here. And uh, we can, if we look up this Bitcoin address on the block explorer ending in 05SH, let's take a look at what that looks like. We can see here that's never been used before. This is a completely fresh uh, receive address and it has no connections. It has no 
history. So that's what things look like on chain. As we said, chain surveillance companies work hard to de-anonymize Bitcoin addresses and associate them with real people in the world. So when you reuse a Bitcoin address, you're not just hurting your own privacy, you're also hurting the privacy of other Bitcoiners by shrinking the anonymity set of Bitcoin addresses. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel. Hit the subscribe button. That really, really does help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. Share this video with a friend or family member. So in terms of de-anonymizing the uh, other Bitcoiners when you reuse addresses, here's a simplified example. Let's say that there are four of us under the chain surveillance microscope or being observed by these companies. Let's say uh, if you, George and Mary, of the four of us and then me, if you three all have Bitcoin addresses that have been linked to your personal identities through Bitcoin address reuse or something like this, then the chain surveillance company can figure out which Bitcoin addresses I control by a process of elimination. They know the identities of three people and I'm the fourth. Fortunately, most modern Bitcoin wallets, as we just saw with Sparrow, will always automatically generate a fresh Bitcoin address each time you receive Bitcoin. This is true for mobile wallets on your phone as well. Sparrow does this really well, as I showed you before. You just go to this Receive tab. Uh, so you have the Transactions tab. This is where you can send from. This is where you receive. And then you have the UTXOs uh, sitting here. So it's a very nice way of visualizing everything. This is actually one of the things that makes Bitcoin special, this UTXO model. UTXO, as I said, stands for unspent transaction output. What it means is it's just a chunk of Bitcoin that can still be spent and it can be in any denomination. So you can think a little bit, you can think of it a little bit like having dollar bills in your wallet. Maybe you have a $1 bill and a $5 bill and a $20 bill. UTXOs can be in any denomination. So you could have a $5 and 10 cent bill, for example, or the Bitcoin equivalent. So that's the UTXO model. And we saw those three UTXOs just sitting there inside my Sparrow wallet. By contrast, almost everything else in the world uses the account model. So when you have a bank account with US dollars in it, you have, you're using the account model or your bank is, you basically have an account that has a certain balance in it that's credited or debited when you make a transaction. This is the same model that Ethereum chose to use, a very bad design choice, this account model where you have a balance and everything goes through that balance. And this can leak a tremendous amount of privacy. Let's say you're doing Ethereum trans ETH transactions and you're doing NFTs, etc. It's very easy to link people um, because of this account model. Ethereum has, as I've said many times on this channel, it's done a really great job of recreating the flawed financial the flawed fiat financial system in many ways using the account model and then of course moving to proof of stake where the more coins you have the more control you have over the protocol in other words ruled by the rich and this is why ethereum even in this very strong bull market is hitting new lows against bitcoin it's been a complete disaster for ethereum since they moved to proof of stake and one reason that ethereum is failing is because it doesn't use utxos it uses the account model and this is a flawed model so the first reason never to reuse a Bitcoin address is this privacy issue. But there's a second reason as well that involves security, and not a lot of people are aware of this. After you spend all the Bitcoin that's sitting at a Bitcoin address, you should never again use that Bitcoin address to receive more Bitcoin. And there's a security reason for this, as I just said. When you sign a Bitcoin transaction in order to move Bitcoin from one address to another, i.e. to send it to yourself, another address that you control, or to send it to someone else, you do this, you make this digital signature or your wallet does in order to prove to the nodes on the Bitcoin network that you have the private keys associated with that particular Bitcoin address and are thus able to sign and unlock the Bitcoin in order to move it. You need the private keys to unlock the Bitcoin in order to send or spend it. Now, when you do this, when you make the signature, your private keys are not exposed to the internet or to the blockchain. And that's one reason we use a hardware wallet like the cold card, for example, to keep our private keys off the internet. So your private keys are not exposed, but your public key associated with that Bitcoin address and your digital signature, of course, are recorded on the blockchain. And again, this is necessary so that Bitcoin nodes all around the world can verify that your signature is legitimate and follows the Bitcoin rules and that you can prove that you really do control this Bitcoin address and thus be allowed by the network to send it. So when you receive Bitcoin into an address that you control, all that anyone can see is a hash 
of your public key. That's when you receive into a fresh address. But when you send Bitcoin from an address that you control, people can see your public key for that address since it's recorded on the blockchain for everyone to view as part of that transaction along with the digital signature. And here's why that's a problem. In the future with powerful quantum computers, people could use those quantum computers to reverse engineer your private keys from that public key that has been posted on the blockchain. But if you have spent all the Bitcoin that was sitting at that address, those private keys derived from the public key won't do them any good because there's gonna be nothing left sitting at that address to steal. Again, this is not a concern today or next year or probably even five years from now, but it could become a concern in the future. And at some point, we're definitely gonna to need to add quantum resistant Bitcoin addresses and signatures to Bitcoin. This is not a problem. This can easily be done. Probably involves a hard fork of some sort though or at least a, another contentious soft fork, then everyone will need to move their coins to these new protected addresses. And I should restate that. I don't think something like this would be that contentious because people would want this sort of quantum protection, quantum resistance in the form of certain addresses. Side note, for those of you who aren't buying Bitcoin because you're afraid of quantum computers, it's always funny with Bitcoin, people worry, never worry about these things, and then somehow they magically become a problem. So no one is stressed about how much how much washing machines and dryers, uh, how much electricity they use worldwide. But all of a sudden when Bitcoin uses electricity, it's a terrible thing. Likewise, people spend zero, zero hours of their day thinking about quantum computers, except when it comes to Bitcoin, all of a sudden everyone's really afraid of quantum computers and thinks they're a quantum computer expert, but know that quantum computers actually pose a much greater threat to banks and government databases. This isn't just a problem for Bitcoin. This is a problem for the entire world. So holding US dollars in a bank, US dollars, which are a melting ice cube that keep losing purchasing power, holding US dollars in a bank instead of Bitcoin because you're worried about quantum computers is a really bad idea. Bitcoiners, in fact, are going to be much faster and efficient at fixing quantum computer problems that are caused to Bitcoin than the underpaid tech who works at Bank of America or Wells Fargo or some bureaucratic government agency. I'm sure there'll be some comment in the comment section below about Monero and its supposedly superior privacy over Bitcoin. Something like if you just use Monero instead, you wouldn't have to worry about address privacy leaks and address reuse. Now there are many problems with Monero that I've talked about in other videos. I'll just summarize them very briefly here. Ring signatures and other privacy tech can cause huge blockchain bloat, which is already affecting the size of the Monero blockchain. And it's not even seen any real adoption. You can imagine how bloated it would become if you ever saw any real adoption of Monero. Also Monero has very little real world adoption compared to Bitcoin, which means something else. It also means that while some of the cryptography may be better for privacy, there are simply many fewer users of Monero as compared with Bitcoin, which means that you're hiding in a much, much smaller anonymity set. And this can become a problem moving in and out of Monero, especially when you move in and out of Monero to Bitcoin or to fiat. Number three, Monero risks inflation bugs and other problems because the base layer is not transparent like Bitcoin's is. The foundation for global money needs to be easily auditable and transparent, not obscure like Monero's is. And then there's a the problem of developing a circular economy. And this is another place that Monero has failed to compete with Bitcoin. It hasn't served as a good store of value. It appears that no one wants to huddle it compared to Bitcoin. And there's some evidence that even drug dealers who accept Monero usually dump it for Bitcoin for their long-term savings. That's one reason the Monero Bitcoin chart looks like this with Monero continuing to lose value against Bitcoin for years and years and years. If you want to go a little bit deeper into the Monero problem, I'll put a link to this one, Monero's Big Fat Problem, as well as Monero is Hot Potato Money, where I talk about circular economies and why they can only develop if you have a community of hodlers. If you have a community of people who are just waiting to dump your cryptocurrency for Bitcoin, then you're going to lose to Bitcoin eventually. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.